your source when you need answers. The Dr. Joe Show on CJAD 800. Well, welcome aboard. Uh, I'm Joe Schwartz, and as you know, I direct McGill's Office for Science and Society, where uh, we hope to keep you guys up to date on what happens in the world of science and separate sense from nonsense. And every Sunday afternoon, I sit here chatting with you about all kinds of uh, interesting scientific things. And uh, today I will have a rather special guest, uh, Phil Rice, who's uh, an author, uh, but that's not really why I have him on today, although the book that he's written, Winter Sun, uh, is of great interest. But the reason I uh, will have him on is because uh, his wife passed away from uh, glioblastoma multiform, which is a brain tumor. And uh, obviously that is of great interest to me because it basically parallels my story. Uh, my wife was diagnosed uh, last June the 3rd with uh, glioblastoma multiform, totally out of the blue. Uh, she just woke up uh, that morning, had a little bit of focal seizure on the side of her face. We went to emergency, they did a CAT scan, and uh, it was um, very clear that uh, there was something uh, in the brain, they immediately sent us to the uh, Montreal Neurological Institute and they did an MRI and it was very clear that um, it was a brain tumor. And by that evening, uh, uh, the surgeon had confirmed that he thought that it was uh, a stage four glioblastoma multiform. Uh, unfortunately, I already knew about this kind of tumor because uh, of the cell phone stories that I had been looking into. And I knew that the prognosis was, was terrible, uh, that the median survival time for such a tumor was uh, about 15 months, and that uh, it was very, very unlikely that without surgery, and there was no surgery possible because the tumor already was widespread, uh, I knew that it was unlikely that it would even reach that. And indeed it didn't. Uh, uh, nine months was uh, all that it, it took, and the last three or four of that were very difficult. So when I, I um, had a note from uh, Phil Rice's agent uh, uh, about this book, I thought you know this would be a very interesting one for me to interview uh, because of our parallel uh, situations. And as you will find out, uh, unfortunately his wife um, lived even a, a shorter period of, of time. Glioblastoma multiforme is, is just a, a, a terrible disease and um, obviously once you are personally involved you take a much greater interest in it and uh, start uh, trying to talk about it and, and trying to raise money for research because that's the only way that uh, this problem can be solved. So uh, that will be coming up after uh, we take the, the break at 15 past the hour for traffic. We will be chatting with Phil Rice. Uh, but the, the book, uh, I'll give you a little preview, is called Winter Sun, and um, it's available um, everywhere, and it promises to be a, a very interesting uh, read, although I think it probably will be a very difficult one for me to go through, but I will. Well, We'll be right back, uh, and uh, as uh, I mentioned, I will be chatting with Phil Rice, uh, who's written what I think promises to be an amazing book called Winter Sun, about dealing with his wife's affliction with glioblastoma multiforme, a terrible type of brain tumor. You're listening to the Dr. Joe Show, CJD 800, News Talk Radio in Montreal. Life's everyday mystery solved. The Dr. Joe Show on CJD 800. I've been doing this radio show now for about 37 years, and uh, as many of our listeners know, I, I do have guests on uh, on occasion, and these guests come about in, in various ways. I get a lot of solicitations from agents uh, asking me to have uh, their clients on the air, and I don't often pay much attention to that. However, uh, this is a very different one, because I did have a, an interesting note from uh, from an agent suggesting uh, the interview that we're going to proceed with here today. And the reason that this is of uh, interest to me is because it is very personal. Uh, Phil Rice uh, is the author of a, uh, of a novel book. And in fact, it is his, um, his first book. It's called Winter Sun. And uh, the reason that it is of great interest to me is because it is all about uh, uh, glioblastoma multiforme, which is... Uh, which is uh, unfortunately the uh, brain tumor that I lost my wife to just uh, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, so, Phil, uh, welcome to the show. 
Thank you. Very uh, happy to be here. And um, your story uh, captivated me, obviously, because it kind of parallels my my personal experience. So bring us up to date a little bit. Tell us why, indeed, you wrote a book uh, about uh, this particular type of brain tumor, what your personal connection is, and uh, what your message is. Well, I um, I wrote the book first and foremost just to... Um, I think, you know, to honor Janice, which was my wife's name, uh, and um, I am a writer, and after I survived the uh, the experience of losing her, and it took a couple of years, but I knew I was going to have to write this, this story, and I felt like it was a gift that she had left me as well, um, that the story itself was, and her love was still would be a part of it that's really the the heart of it so that's that's what led me to write it it's it was cathartic in uh, in many ways but also just um i felt like that not just the experience i had shared uh, that i had gone through but what i had learned in the in the aftermath and how i had kind of pulled it together later on was a story that that was important to share how old was your wife when she was first diagnosed well, she has, she had just turned sixty. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Very, that also hits very close to home. And how did it first present? Well, um, and we weren't even we weren't actually married at the time. Uh, we were uh, we had been engaged for one month, and uh, had had been at Niagara Falls. That's where we where I asked her to marry me, and. Almost immediately, as it, it seemed, like the week after we returned, she began showing signs of, uh, just at first it was like head cold signs, um, and was having an ear infection, or what she thought was an ear infection, and it just wouldn't go away. So that was like for two, for like two weeks, I would say. And, um, and then her behavior started showing, um, initially just, acting very exhausted and uh, as though she were moving in slow mo uh, slow motion, you know, and speaking in slow motion, uh, very low ter uh, tones. And she was hesitant to go to the doctor, and we uh, that's also in the book. It took me a while to to get her to do that. Well, actually, we did go to a, we went to a, a, um, a clinic first, and they said it was an ear infection and gave her some antibiotics. Um, and uh, so she took those for about a week, but obviously it didn't help. And um, by the time that, that the behavioral issues started, and, and it was pretty far along, of course, I didn't know that then. But um, And I finally did talk her in. Well, I just said, I'm taking you to the emergency room one night when, when it just there was no other thing, you know, no other way to, to treat it, it seemed. So I would imagine did a CAT scan, did an MRI, and uh, it showed a stage four tumor. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, they they did the t they weren't if they weren't in any big hurry at first. They didn't uh, seem to, uh, to 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 think much of it initially. Um, but after the test, yes, then this this young doctor came in and was pale in the face actually, and said, you know, we can't do anything here. This and they sent us to another hospital right away. So was there any surgery planned? The surgery happened the very next day. And it was uh, that big. In fact, right. he said, you know, it's very possible that had we not gone that night, that that the rate that it was growing, it very well could have taken her the next day. You know, within the next day, so that the timing was. And she went through, I would assume, the six weeks of chemo and radiation. No, unfortunately, not. Um, the uh, the surgery itself, um, well, in, it, it was expected to be a three hour surgery. It took um, closer to ten, and the surgeon called me in and, and was explaining what he found. And this was the first time I, I mean, up until then, I really didn't know what was going on, other than there was a mass in her right. brain. But he said that it was stage four, that he was certain. You know, he, was, he had sent it away for official testing, but he had no doubt. And um, and then he said that um, 
that with radiation and treatment she she could live another 12 to 16 months and as i say in the book he, he actually sort of said that with a with an upbeat as though this was the good news right. and i understand you know from his perspective why that i would come to understand it even more why that would was sort of the good news out of what he had to tell me but unfortunately she she had and he had he had nicked something he, he told me this as well he didn't know how it was going to show up but he said in the removal there had been some brain damage slight brain damage he didn't know what how it would show up but what it ended up showing up as it, it, it she'd never healed well enough to do any radiation so she didn't live um that 12 months or anything so how long did she live after the surgery um it was three months two and a half three months I, she died on may on march um second and had been diagnosed december 15th you know the previous december so yeah that's uh, that's pretty fast because it, it was fast yeah the median is really a, it's about 15 16 months so yeah it was uh Doubly, uh, doubly unlucky, but uh, I mean, glioblastoma multiforme is uh, obviously just a terrible type of of, uh, of cancer because there's no hope. It's there, you know, there's no light at the end of the tunnel for for this. Uh, uh, most uh, in rare cases, people will live about three years, but even that's uh, that's right. quite rare. Now, I know that uh, uh, in your book, uh, you talk uh, a lot about uh, what it was like uh, during those months and uh, your caregiver experience. And uh, so you want to tell us a little bit about, about that, because I, I, uh, I think that that's also a big part of your uh, memoir. Well, yes, that's, that is. And I, um, well, initially, of course, I mean, really starting from that conversation where he's, he's given me the, the news of the possibility of 12 to 16 months, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, I, um, as I was digesting that, um, you know, we were engaged. We'd already been talking about the spring as a uh, to to be married, and I started thinking, well, okay, you know, um, maybe this can still happen. You know, and I started thinking along those terms. I mean, I had to immediately come to some acceptance um and just look at it okay what what can we do here and it's like well looks like we might have a chance to still spend some life together and do this marriage and you know uh, i began to see that 12 months to 16 months as a as a window and uh um and that's the way i initially approached it she was in uh, the neurological icu um where was this actually uh, this is pittsburgh pennsylvania okay uh, it's uh, Allegheny General mm -hmm. Hospital, and um, she. Um, well, they kept telling me they they kept having more optimistic expectations, you know, that I'd be able to. She should come around the, by the next morning, and we could visit. But she she didn't. She didn't uh, regain consciousness for several days, and and ended up in fact staying in the uh, ICU for three weeks. Um, and the whole time, it just kept, you know, the, the message was, well, okay, well, she just needs to get a little bit better. Mm -hmm. We can start this radiation and the chemo. And, okay, hold, hold that uh, thought, Phil, for, for a moment. We have to take a, a break. I'm, I'm uh, talking to Phil Rice, who's, who's an author, and his book, Winter Sun, tells of his experience uh, after his wife was uh, diagnosed with uh, glioblastoma multiforme. Uh, which is a terrible kind of brain tumor, and we'll get around to talking about uh, caregiving for uh, these kind of uh, situations. As you're listening to the Dr. Joe Show, CJD 800, News Talk Radio in Montreal. We'll be right back. Science you can use. The Dr. Joe Show on CJD 800. My guest today is Phil Rice, who's written a book called Winter Sun, and as I mentioned at the onset, this uh, was of particular interest to me because uh, his wife, like mine, passed away from uh, a brain tumor called glioblastoma multiforme, which is a terrible kind of uh, affliction. Uh, in uh, his case, though, she had surgery and, and lived only for, for a few months. In, in our case, uh, there was no surgery because it was not possible. The, the tumor was already uh, uh, too diffuse and, and, and widespread. But uh, there was six weeks of radiation and, and chemo, and, and she she did live for uh, nine months, and uh, about five or six uh, months of that was uh, 
quite acceptable, but the the last three or four months were um, really very very difficult. So um, we were talking about uh, you know um, caregiving, uh, etc. And I think you addressed that uh, in your book. And and uh, um, is there any advice that you would uh, offer based on your experience to people who are in such a situation in terms of caregiving? Well, um, I I don't know if I can share my experience with that at, at any rate. Um, and obviously, there's there's circumstances that seem to be as you pointed out with your situation. You know, there's going to always be a difference uh, in circumstances. But in my case, I um, you know initially it was all through the hospital. But as time went on, and you know, they I was. I was with her all the time. That that was something I had because I was a freelance writer and I had been doing teaching on a freelance basis. I was able to just stay with her in the hospital, and um, I never saw. I, I I didn't see her getting getting better, even though they kept saying, "Well, okay, if she gets better, you know, we can do this and we can do that." Well, it just wasn't happening. And at some point, I just realized that. Well, you know, she's not, and the radiation isn't going to happen. And uh, that's when when I. And I did marry her in the hospital. I had a, um, an Episcopal priest come in and perform a ceremony for us. Um, and at a certain point, I was very lucky to have... I started having doctors who really just laid it on the line because they weren't doing that initially. And I went to a radiologist, and he says, well, okay, at this point, we could give her... I could give her a, a condensed dose, a two-week treatment, and she might live for a few more weeks as a result of that, but it's going to be horrible. It's going to be a horrible time for her, but whatever that extended time is. And so obviously that, that just was instantly off the table as far as I was concerned. So um, my goal was to, to get her home at that point. And uh, she was actually very uh, cognizant during these days and, um, was trying to walk. She was a hiker by by hobby and uh, was trying to walk, but because of the brain damage from removing the tumor, the left side of her body never really returned. It didn't return fully. She had about 5 or 10% is all. So, you know, that's where we were, but in, the doctor, um, at the we'd been transferred to another hospital and she, for physical therapy, and the doctor said, well, it's, you know, that physical therapy isn't really possible. There's nothing that's going to get better. And this doctor, who was wonderful, and you know, she's the one that um, presented me with the option of taking her home. And uh, and I just, you know, I, I grabbed that and um, was able to get hospice involved at this point. Um, I already had hospice involved with my mother, who was still alive at this point, uh, under the care of hospice. So I, I knew where to call, at least. And uh, we were able to f- fix up my house. Uh, you know, Janice and I did live together in this house, and it was our home. And uh, I fixed up my living room as a, an infirmary and um, was able to get her home. And that was uh, the victory, you know, as it turned out. That was it. That was the miracle that that was going to happen. And, you know, a lot of people had been telling me about what miracles could happen, et cetera. Well, this was the miracle that happened, if, if one happened, was that we actually got her home and were able to be with her for the, for the next three or four weeks. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that you, you mentioned here in the, in the synopsis that I was uh, sent why uh, staying present and involved is important even when a loved one is unconscious. And uh, that, that's an interesting uh, point of view, uh, because many people would think, well, you know, if, if someone is unconscious, uh, you know, what uh, what sense is there in just sitting by? And uh, right. but, So what, um, uh, you have a different view on that. Well, and that started in the ICU, actually, uh, which initially was uncon- you know, basically in a coma. They, they didn't use that word, but that's what, what it was. And, yeah, I, um, from the very beginning, uh, um, would you don't you weren't allowed to go in very often to the ICU, but whatever time I could get with her, I was touching her, uh, you know, holding her hand or massaging her feet. I was speaking to her in regular tones, and uh, she enjoyed poetry. She enjoyed my reading of poetry, 
and I so I would read some of what I knew to be her favorite poems, either some that I had written or that were in anthologies, that sort of thing. And just I just kept doing that, and and I don't when she came around, you know, there was never a point where I was able to discuss this with her and say, did you were you aware of it? I just had a sense, and this is the way I feel about it, is that. You know, there there is an awareness on some level at, in those situations, and it was um, it was my way of being loving in uh, in that moment, which is what, as time went on, I began to understand more and more is really what we have. You know, right. that's what that's what that's what was still there through all of this and and all of the terminology or what have you. And then by the time we got home, it was it was. Um, she did have a, a few weeks of being relatively cognizant, able to communicate, able to speak. Um, never fully back, uh, really, but she was able to, to do that. And you know, I, I continued doing the same things. Everything was very uh, appealing to the senses, uh, music, um, photographs, and, and just, you know, I just stayed in touch with her. I stayed with her uh, as close to her as I could, you know, literally and figuratively. And um, then when she did slip back into a coma towards the end, you know, it was the same thing. I, I, I never stopped doing any mm-hmm. of that. Yeah, it's very um, in, very interesting to say that because it's a very parallel situation. Uh, uh, I uh, bought all the old I Love Lucy TV shows because that was her favorite, and uh, we kept watching those. And uh, that actually gave her, you know, a little bit of, uh, of pleasure. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's the same idea. I had someone had given me. We were Janice and I met in the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, uh, originally, and we both loved the mountains. She especially loved the mountains. And somebody gave me a a, a history of the Smoky Mountains. It was like, or the, the Appalachian Mountains. Mm-hmm. It's like three CDs or uh, DVDs. I'm sorry. And that was the last thing she she focused on of that sort you know but she really did she was just transfixed and you know that was several hours worth of viewing and and it's just a marvelous moment you know and and to experience well phil we're almost out of time here but let me ask you just one last question uh prior to her diagnosis now that you look back were there any signs of something uh strange going on no not in not until about a week or two where it really began to look strange as far as like mm-hmm. this is something i i don't understand you know i thought it was just a head cold sort of situation right. because in my case i mean we weren't aware at the time but then thinking back uh she did have some difficulty in um, the texting you know and sometimes letters were turned around and words were a bit out of place but but uh my daughters and I never th- thought much of it because, you know, thought, you know, just texting quickly or whatever. But mm-hmm. now looking back, I think those were the, the first uh, signs. Anyway, well, I, I, tell you, yeah. I, I did do a little quick research when I was, and I put in things like that, like behavioral. And on an Internet site, it actually came up that one of the things that might be happening was a brain tumor. Right. <laughs> I was like, well, that's not, no, that's not what's going on, but, you know. Well, unfortunately, bad things happen. But I'm looking yeah. forward to reading the book. Uh, so the book is called Winter Sun, and uh, the author is uh, Phil Rice, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be a very compelling account of dealing with this terrible affliction called glioblastoma multiform. And uh, the book, I assume, is available everywhere and probably on Amazon as well. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's correct. So the, it's called Winter Sun, and, and thanks very much, Phil, for uh, uh, chatting with me on, on this uh, rather, you know, uh, close-to-my-heart topic. Okay, uh, so thanks I very much. I appreciate it. And uh, all the best to you. Thank you. you. You as well. Thanks. So that was Phil Rice, the author of Winter Sun, uh, and it's a book uh, talking about uh, his escapades dealing with his wife's uh, glioblastoma multiform, a terrible type of brain tumor. You're listening to the Dr. Joe Show, CJD 800 News Talk Radio in Montreal. We'll be right back. Your source when you need answers. The Dr. Joe Show on CJAD 800. Well, I'll admit that uh, that was one more difficult interviews to do because, of uh, of course, uh, it's pretty hard to talk about these things uh, as if they were, you know, remote. Uh, it's... Uh, it's uh, 
things are very different when you're personally involved. I mean, you know, I've, I've been uh, uh, teaching and talking about various kinds of cancer for, you know, now going on to 40 years, but, but uh, uh, it's very different when you speak to a class about it, you know, and you are objective and talk only about facts, but, but when uh, it uh, hits home, that's a very, very different kind of a, a story. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, everything that you, you think you knew about science uh, uh, seems to, to evaporate and uh, you have to handle this uh, novel situation.